So I'm from a postdoc in Andrew Collins' group, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how differences in the antibody genes that we each carry can um, go on to shape the diversity of the antibody repertoires that people make, and ultimately may play a role in the types of immune responses that you can make. So um, most of the kind of research in our group revolves around, oh, is this the laser pointer? Uh, this kind of question of how does individual variation in the antibody genes segments that each of us carry um, flow on into the types of antibody, sensitive antibodies that each individual can make? And does this have any consequence to the type of antibody responses that people make? So basically we're trying to look at the extent of individual diversity in um, antibody genes and to look at if there's actually any consequences of having different antibody genes. Because ultimately what we want to be able to do is make predictions um, about given an understanding of the types of antibody genes that you carry, um, can we say anything about your potential to respond to infection or to respond to vaccination? So um, probably a good place to start is what are antibody genes and what do I mean by antibody diversity? Uh, so here is our little cartoon depiction of what an antibody looks like. Um, and obviously antibodies are very important in response to infection because they allow the immune system to identify foreign invaders and to assist in destroying them. Um, so uh, the way an antibody functions is at one end of this Y-shaped molecule, we have a region that's specific for the antigen, and while at the other end, um, the constant region is able to interact with different components of the immune system. So a human can make um, many billions of different antibodies, and the, the way they differ is at this um, region here that binds to antigen. And um, the reason you want to make many millions of different um, antibodies is you, your immune system needs to be ready at any moment in time to respond to whatever random antigen you're going to encounter. Um, so, but obviously we can't have one single gene for every one of these antibodies because the human genome just can't contain that much information. So the immune system's evolved a, um, a modular type approach to forming these antibodies um, by actually undertaking genomic rearrangement in some specific immune cells. And so the way it does this is we have different modules. Um, so here we have V, D, and J. And this is what, in every cell in the human body, you have these genes, but only in specific immune cells um, do these become rearranged to form the final antibody genes. So what you do is you get um, a select, um, from each of these sets, you'll get one gene selected. These are brought together to give you your final antibody gene, which is encoding this part that's specific for the antigen. Um, also, this process of gene um, recombination or rearrangement um, is inaccurate. So even when you select the same gene segments, you don't end up with the same antibody. So what you're doing is using this modular type approach to put together a set of antibodies. And by antibody diversity, I just mean the composition of that set. So in terms of individual variation, you can imagine that if you start with different set, a different set of genes, bang, at least the glass didn't break. Um, <laughs> that would be dramatic. Uh, would I have one most entertaining if that happened? Um, <laughs> What was I saying? Yeah, so, in, so individual variation. So you can imagine if you start with different sets of genes, you're going to end up with a different set of antibodies. And what we want to examine is, you know, does that lead to different abilities to make immune responses? So if antibody diversity is about the composition of a set of antibodies, how can it have shape? So um, these type of rearrangement events aren't random. So you don't get, ra there's actually biases in the, type, in the selection of the gene segments. So you can get some antibodies that are made more commonly and some that are made so rarely that you may only make that rearrangement once in your entire lifetime. Or they may, you may have um, antibodies that you could potentially make that are never made. Um, so what this ends up doing is giving a shape to the distribution of unique antibodies within the set of antibodies that you make. So you have some that are higher probability rearrangements um, which are made very frequently, so you may always have these type of antibodies present, um, and you'll get the very rare antibodies that are just made on occasion. So um, in terms of individual variation, you can imagine that if someone's lacking one of these genes that tends to rearrange at high frequency, there could be um, potential consequences for the set of antibodies that they make, and then does that lead to some deficiency in their immune responses? So there's many reasons that you might be interested in this whole extent of individual variation and the consequences of it, but I'm interested in it for the very boring reason of I like to make computational models of human antibody responses. Um, in order to do that, um, we need to understand how these um, th things here interact. So we need to understand how the genes that are available to make antibodies impact on the sets of antibodies an individual makes, and how and what how this set of antibodies, when you get sick, like this guy here, I made this myself, I'm available for graphic design if you need it. <laughs> um, actually, have, what, how the set of antibodies available when you can't, when you actually get sick, might, might impact on your ability to make a response. So how did we come to work it? How did we come to work on this? Well, we've been looking at um, 
anybody gene sequences since the early 2000s, and back then when I was doing honors, I've been here forever, um, <laughs> we were looking at um, tens to hundreds of sequences, and we're trying to understand that rearrangement process, so how those gene segments were coming together, and we were focused on developing tools that allow us to look at the final rearranged antibody sequence and work out you know, how it was made, and making these sort of processes more accurate. Um, this all sort of changed in like 2009 when um, Scott Boyd, our collaborator at Stanford, came up with an approach for high throughput sequencing of um, antibody sequences from single individuals. Um, this really changed how we undertake our research, partly because we went from having tens and hundreds of sequences to suddenly having tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sequences from single individuals. Um, but what this has allowed us to do is begin to explore individual variation in the antibody genes. Um, and in doing this, and we have found that um, each individual, so each one of you out there, has slightly, seems to have a slightly different set of genes available. So there's quite a lot of variability in the population. We've also been able to extend this, and this is some of the work of Marie, who's sitting on the front here, um, to looking at how those gene segments are actually arranged on individual chromosomes, and so I to look at them in sort of more distinct populations. Um, in terms of the challenges we've encountered during our work, um, mostly the challenges came from the need to, from this um, sudden change from having you know, just a few thousand sequences to suddenly having a million sequences to deal with. And we'd spent all this time developing approaches that now weren't scalable to our new data sets, which meant that we got to spend a whole lot of time developing new approaches or um, extending existing ones to deal with our data. Um, we also had this issue where we wanted to look at things at an individual level, but there was no existing approach for actually determining the gene segments available given the type of data that we had. So um, as I highlighted in those few papers earlier, we had to go about developing our own methods for this so that we could make use of the data that we have to study what we wanted, but we also need to automate these approaches because while doing 10 genotypes is somewhat annoying, doing 100 is really annoying, and doing 1,000 is impossible. Um, so in terms of the real-world applications of our research, um, one example is sort of reverse engineering the antibody response. So in the case, and for the purposes of vaccine design. So um, some people, when they get infected with viruses like HIV or influenza, will make a special type of antibody called a broad neutralizing antibody. This stick figure's really happy with himself for doing so. Um, so broad neutralizing antibodies are special in that instead of just targeting, uh, having the ability to target, say, one strain of influenza, they can bind to multiple strains of influenza. Obviously, that's a good thing to have because you you have some degree of protection against future strains that not only have you not encountered yet, but nature may not have produced yet. Um, the problem being that only a very select few individuals make these type of antibodies, and in the case of HIV, they usually only make them after many years of infection. So identifying these antibodies is actually pretty easy. So we can pull out antigen-specific antibodies from a person pretty simply these days, but what we don't understand is how these antibodies actually uh, evolve during an immune response. Um, so the type of models that we work on allow us to start to make these links. So pulling out the antigen-specific antibodies, we can start to look back at how this person may have made them compared to someone else. Um, we're also able to use these approaches for monitoring immune responses. Um, so here we have, um, these are seven different individuals, and we're looking at their response to influenza vaccines, just their annual regular seasonal influenza. Um, if you focus on individual A here, hopefully what you can see is there's three different colours around the arc. Um, so these are just different time points that we sampled these individuals at. Um, so red is before their vaccination, green is seven days after, and then purple is um, 21 days later. And all you need to know to interpret this is the more blue lines there are, the stronger the antibody response. Um, so you'll see that individual A here made a good response at day seven and it had fallen back to background by day 21. Um, but what you can also tell is that no one, all these individuals make slightly different responses, so there's a fair amount of variation. So we're not only able to just detect responses, but because we know the antibody sequences that are actually responding, we can start to characterise the response, look for is there similarities in the types of antibodies that people make in response to, say, flu vaccine. Um, one last quick thing where, that um, we can mention is, um, so this is what the um, results of computational modelling look like. It's not like cool like on TV. Um, but what this does show us is that there's some antibodies that are made much more commonly, and if the immune system has evolved to produce particular antibodies at high frequency, there's a likelihood that they serve some functional importance. So um, because of the way we undertake this modelling, we actually know the sequences of these antibodies that are made very commonly and that are shared between different people. So we can actually express these antibodies, look at what they bind to, and see if they have any kind of therapeutic applications. Um, so I just want to thank the people involved in this work, uh, people from Andrew's lab, Bruno, who um, helps out with the computational stuff, and then Scott and Andy at Stanford. <laughs>
and any questions. And um, just one last point. Um, so this is actually the results of, gene, of looking at the antibody genes in different people. So this is each line as a person, and as you can see, it's pretty varied.